Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy false prophets and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor as the labor progresses the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes as we get closer to jesus return all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense all of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Oppose gender affirming care and LGBTQ ideologies, you can forget becoming a foster parent. New proposed Biden administration guidelines known as the Safe and Appropriate Foster Care Placement Requirements may prevent children from being placed in the homes of Christians. Well, joining us to explain is Dr. Jameson Taylor, Senior Fellow at the American Family Association. So, Jameson, 60% of licensed foster care homes claim to be practicing Christians. Tell us more, what might this mean for the U.S. foster care system? What listeners really need to understand about this is that this is not just about foster care. Certainly this rule and accompanying legislation in the Senate and the U.S. House, there's a bill called the Paris Hilton Bill. This rulemaking and this bill together will drive Christians out of the foster care system. But the most important thing for listeners to understand is that this is not just about foster care. When the Biden administration is saying that if you are a Christian parent or a Christian foster care provider, that you are not providing a safe environment for kids, what they mean is you're providing a dangerous environment for kids. And when kids are in danger, that's defined as abuse. So what they are literally doing is beginning to define Christian parents teaching a biblical worldview, define that as a form of abuse if you deny basically the LGBTQ lifestyle for your children. That is where this is headed. They're beginning with foster care, but there's a push already to terminate parental rights when parents do not agree with their child's chosen LGBTQ lifestyle. Okay, so this goes way beyond foster care. It's just the beginning, a slippery slope. Explain how you think this policy would demonstrate bias against Christian foster parents. Give us an example. Uh, this would be, I mean, this would be any parent who, for instance, believes that it's, it's not healthy for their child to undergo, for instance, an experimental sex change operation. Uh, this is not just about Christians. This is about, this is about parents trying to do what is best for their children's mental health and their children's physical health. Literally what this is about is replacing parents, terminating parental rights, replacing parents with the government. And we're seeing this in states like Minnesota and California that are so-called trans refuge states. What that means if a state is a trans refuge state is that they're allowing kids, let's say from Mississippi or Texas or wherever it may be, those kids, let's say they, they you know, you meet a you meet a man online and this friend drives you to Minnesota and you get a sex change operation. The state of Minnesota is not going to allow the parents of that child to get their child back. They're essentially terminating those parental rights and putting that child into the Minnesota foster care system, terminating those parental rights and you know, basically allowing that child to go through an experimental sex change procedure. And we're, we're well beyond the slippery slope, frankly. 
uh, the Biden administration is doing everything that they can to terminate and weaken parental rights in every possible way that they can. Are members of Congress, uh, state legislatures doing anything to try to stop this new policy? What can people do about it? Yeah, there has not been enough pushback. I think, one, it begins with the churches. Churches have to get political, and that means they have to stand up for their rights because their rights are being terminated. The rights of Christian parents are being terminated. Again, this is already happening in states like Minnesota and California. What the Biden administration is trying to do is to make this nationwide. Contact your governor and ask your governor to fight the Biden administration's efforts in foster care, to fight their attempts to push Christians out of foster care. The second thing that people need to do is contact your U.S. House member and your U.S. Senator and tell them to vote no on the Paris Hilton bill. This is the bill that would drive Christian foster care providers out of foster care. It would drive Christian group homes out of that setting. The third thing that people need to do, and this really hits home, is you have to take away your kid's phone or don't give them a smartphone, number one. Number two, get your kids off of social media. And then number three, if you can, pray, you know, pray about it. If you can, take your kids out of public school because it's phones, it's social media, and it's public schools that are the main propaganda points for the LGBTQ lifestyle. And so parents have, you know, you have to begin where you are, begin at home. You have to protect your kids from these ideologies that are being forced onto them. You have to protect them from the predators that they're meeting online. And again, we're literally in a situation where a child can meet someone online and, and then accompany that person to a state like Minnesota. The child undergoes an experimental sex change operation and your parental rights are gone. Brothers and sisters, persecution is here. Believers in Jesus Christ believe in the authority of the Bible. We believe homosexuality is a sin and marriage is between one man and one woman. We believe in the sanctity of life and that abortion is murder and is a sin. We believe God created us male and female and it is a sin to identify as a transgender. We believe Jesus is the only way to heaven and that believing in any other way will send a person to hell. Get yourself spiritually prepared because true Christians will be persecuted like no other time in history. This persecution will be based off of what the world perceives to be moral and right, and not what the Bible says. The sad thing is that many people who profess to be Christ followers will go the way of the world. These professing Christians are called lukewarm in the book of Revelation and are not saved. The world will persecute true Christians, and scripture tells us the lukewarm Christians will persecute them as well, as we read in Matthew 24, 9 and 10. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Many who professed faith in Jesus as the Messiah in easier times will deny him and cooperate in exposing those who are true believers. The external hatred from the world puts all true believers in Christ under pressure. This in turn produces internal hatred among the professing Christian community during the tribulation. When the pressure comes, those who are not genuine believers will do three things. Fall away, deliver up one another, and hate one another. Matthew 24, 9 and 10 lay out a future time of great persecution for true believers in Jesus. Many in the church will avoid this persecution by betraying fellow disciples in Christ to the persecutors. Persecution is here. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Picture this, it's the last day of your kid's winter break. You're making dinner for the fourth grade son when all of a sudden you get an email from your kid's school principal. Dear families, one adult who the students know as Miss Angela has begun the process of transitioning from Miss Angela to Mr. Angel. When we all return from break, students and staff will be asked to call him Mr. Angel and will be using he, him pronouns. Upon our return, teachers will co-teach a lesson about the faculty member's transition in accordance with school policy. They will be reading a book called It Feels Good to Be Yourself, a book about gender. That's what happened at Mar Vista Elementary School in Normandy Park, Washington, just 20 miles outside Seattle. Parents say they were completely caught off guard. And what about the book? Well, we opened it, 
Here's a passage. Whether you feel like a boy, a girl, or both, or neither, or if you describe yourself another way, that is your gender identity. See, when you were born, you couldn't tell people who you were or how you felt. They looked at you and they made a guess. I saw a penis and I guessed it was a boy. I mean, this is for fourth graders. Parents in the school district aren't happy. Opt my kids from those kind of clubs. You want to opt them out? Yes. Why? Why are you okay. concerned? What group? Um, yes, I'm not interested in teaching them those kind of clubs to my kids. You, yeah. That curriculum, you don't want that? No. Primetime reached out to the school for comment, and of course, they defended their actions, saying this. Teachers conducted the lesson in one fourth grade classroom where Mr. Angel is known by students. The goal of the lesson is to provide students with an age-appropriate understanding about the name change. So for those of you keeping track at home, Washington State ranks 31st in test scores. But don't worry, they spent the whole day transitioning their janitor. Deuteronomy 22.5 A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all who do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. A teacher at a high school in Seattle allegedly told students that identifying as straight is offensive. He scolded male students for being a product of the patriarchy. Jason Rance brought us this story, and Jason's with us now. How is saying you are straight offensive? Well, according to this teacher, it is offensive because, and this is a direct quote, it implies that to not be straight is to be crooked, which could have negative connotations. I mean, it's obviously absurd. This is a teacher who, a few weeks ago, I did a story about how he failed a, qui uh, a kid on a quiz because the kid said men can't get pregnant. So I think we know where this guy is coming from. Hmm. But the reason why this is so important is there are many educators just like this guy who's in front of your kids every single weekday and is putting all of this in their heads. Mm -hmm. And unless you're aware of it as a parent, unfortunately, you're not gonna be able to deprogram all of this progressive propaganda that's getting pushed in front of your kids every single day, and I think that that's dangerous. The Bible teaches us not to follow after philosophers and deceivers of the world, as we read in Colossians 2.8, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. As we watch world events unfold, it is as if we are all watching the same movie. Yet at the same time, Christians and unbelievers are seeing two separate stories. Christians are watching world events unfold, just as the Bible said it would, right before Jesus returns. Christians long for Christ's return, as we are looking forward to the day He rules and reigns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We look forward to a day when there will be no more lawlessness, a time of peace and harmony with all creation. Unbelievers, on the other hand, are trying to create their own utopian society, where lawlessness runs unchecked and every kind of evil is thought to be good. Christians have been given the Spirit of God as a gift, as we read in 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 16. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God, these things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, speaking of the unsaved, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Paul goes on to say this in Galatians 6, 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. The unsaved are doing the desires of their father the devil, as we read in John 8, 44. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. The reality at the end of these two stories also have different outcomes. The prophet Daniel put it succinctly, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Which do you choose, everlasting life or shame and everlasting contempt? It's up to you.
eternity with God or eternity in the lake of fire. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. The violence is expanding far beyond the war in Gaza. Pakistan has launched strikes inside Iran after Iran attacked targets in Pakistan. In the meantime, the U.S. says it hit more missile sites of Iran-backed rebels inside Yemen. Chris Livesay is in northern Israel with more on that part of the story. In the last 10 days in this area alone, we've tracked more than 30 rocket salvos coming from just the other side of this hill where Hezbollah is based. It's just the latest flashpoint in what's become a dizzying string of conflicts. Just days after Iran launched attacks on what it called militant groups in nearby Pakistan, Syria and Iraq. This morning, Pakistan responded, launching missiles on Iran's southeast border region. It says also targeting terrorist hideouts. Among the dead, three women and four children, according to local media. This as violence in the Middle East spills from one crisis into the next. Following the Hamas massacre of Israeli civilians on October 7th and Israel's war on Hamas in Gaza. The U.S. military says it destroyed 14 missile positions in Yemen overnight, calling them an imminent threat that could have been fired at any time. Belonging to the Iran-backed Houthis, seen here parading their weapons in the capital, Sana'a. For months, the armed militants have been attacking merchant ships and the U.S. military there to protect them in what they claim is opposition to the war in Gaza, flouting repeated warnings. These attacks are a clear example of terrorism, violation of international law, and a major threat to innocent lives and to global commerce. Yesterday, the U.S. designated them a terrorist group, but they remain defiant. The Yemeni armed forces will not hesitate to target all threats in the Arab Sea and Red Sea, said a military spokesman, and to continue supporting the oppressed Palestinian people. In fact, uh, Hezbollah is vowing to continue striking Israel. We can still hear the, the exchange of fire all around us. This, as the Israeli defense forces say that the chances now of a full-blown war erupting here in the north are now noticeably higher. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17:1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. The latest strikes by the U.S. against the rebel group in Yemen that has been targeting commercial shipping in the Red Sea, disrupting one of the world's key shipping routes. This was the fourth time that the U.S. has taken military action against the Iran-backed Houthis in Yemen in just the last week, and this was swift and significant. The Pentagon saying that the Houthis were about to fire 14 missiles towards commercial ships and Navy vessels in the area of the Red Sea, saying the missiles were actually on the launchers, ready to go, the threat imminent. So the U.S. took preemptive action, launching a barrage of Tomahawk missiles from Navy vessels, taking out those Houthi missiles before they could even be fired. This happened just hours after a Houthi drone fired on a U.S.-owned commercial ship, causing minor damage. The fourth time the U.S. has launched an attack on the Houthis, but they seem undeterred. They sure do, Rob. And the Houthis, who say this is to show their support for Palestinians in Gaza, say they will continue these strikes on ships, and there have been more than 30 in the last three months. The Pentagon will keep firing back as well, still trying to avoid a wider war. For three days, this low-lying coastal area in northern Lebanon was inundated when nearby rivers overflowed during heavy rains. The waters may have receded, but people's lives have been turned upside down. Many homes suffered extensive damage. Nada Al Ali tells us the water reached up to her waist. Those living here are some of the most vulnerable in Lebanon, where the economy has all but collapsed. 
I lost everything. I have nothing left. I don't know where I'm going to stay. Relatives will let you stay for a few days. But then what? Many here lost their livelihoods. They are demanding compensation from those in power who they accuse of corruption and neglecting deteriorating infrastructure. Every year they make promises and do nothing. They don't care about us. As you can see, we are not able to deal with this crisis alone. Days of heavy rain transformed roads into rivers of mud. There are several informal settlements for refugees from neighboring Syria in this region as well. Tents were submerged by water that rose quickly. Hundreds of families were saved, but many are again homeless. This is the first time we experienced something like this. All of a sudden, the water level rose. I had to be rescued by the Lebanese army. People here say the floods is the worst they've seen in years, and it's now happening each year. The river's water level reached up to here. Experts say global climate change is leading to intense bouts of rain after long periods of dry weather, and that's also contributing to the crisis. Concern is growing among communities living here, near the banks of two rivers, that the worst is yet to come. And more bad weather is forecast for next week. Millions across the country in the grip of brutally cold weather already claim more than two dozen lives. Alex Perez starts us off in Chicago. Good morning, Alex. The feel like temperature right now here is in the teens. Now, I want you to take a look. You can see right here in this harbor and parts of Lake Michigan now blanketed in ice. This cold has been brutal, relentless, and in some cases, deadly. This morning, at least 37 people have died after an unrelenting, bone-chilling Arctic blast from coast to coast. In Tennessee alone, authorities reporting at least 14 deaths. And in Oregon, at least three people dying of hypothermia. The bitter weather, downing trees, triggering power outages, streets turned into ice skating rinks. This pickup truck losing traction, plowing into a mailbox. You guys okay? Yeah. I'm glad you're safe. We had three accidents right here. In Chicago, the Windy City gripped by the cold. For the first time since 1966, three consecutive days with a high of less than five degrees, leaving Tesla drivers stranded with electric charging stations dead. It's the type of cold that it freezes your skin almost, it feels like pins or needles pricking you. We have reached the stage where there is literally no pause between major weather disasters hitting the world. It is just one disaster after another. When times were normal, there would be a major disaster every once in a while. But now we have reached the stage where there's literally no pause between them. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Psalm 18.7 Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken, because he was angry. I'm here in East Flores, and to my right, you can see Mount Lewatobi Lakilaki. The volcano has been erupting consistently since December, and as you can see now, it's erupting again. You can see the thick gray smoke coming from the volcano, and we can also hear this steady, loud grumbling as the volcano continues to erupt. In early January, authorities increased the alert level of the volcano to the highest possible warning status, and the regional government has urged people not to go within five kilometers of the volcano's crater. It has also warned people to be on alert for further cold lava floods if heavy rain occurs. Seismic data indicates a significant increase in low-frequency earthquakes. That means the movement of magma is intensifying. Experts say this means the volume of lava is likely to increase. More than 6,300 people have been evacuated from their homes in villages close to the volcano. Here in the poverty-stricken Kabul suburbs, thousands form a queue to collect essential aid. Most are returnees from Pakistan after its government ordered the expulsion of illegal immigrants last year. They've made a long journey and have waited hours in the freezing cold. If we adults don't have enough to eat for several days, that's OK. But we cook rice or soup for the children. We can't let our children die of hunger. We don't have any wood, 
so we fill cans with hot water to keep ourselves warm. We've recently arrived from Pakistan and couldn't bring anything with us. The blankets and all these things were given to us by my brother. But these returnees are just among millions of others in Afghanistan who are facing months of hunger and a bitter winter. More than half of the Afghan population today relies on humanitarian aid, and a staggering 98 percent of the population lack enough food to eat. The country has also endured decades of conflict that have destroyed livelihoods and displaced millions, and bore the brunt of climate change-induced hardships and more frequent natural disasters. The onset of winter has only made things worse, with most families lacking the means to buy fuel or firewood to keep warm. All this against the backdrop of an economic crisis. Since the Taliban returned to power in 2021, humanitarian aid to Afghanistan has plummeted, as countless people are unable to access work and without income opportunities. Today, Afghanistan is one of the poorest countries in the world. UN aid agencies say famine already exists in pockets of Gaza, with winter making the situation worse. Continuous bombardment by Israel has left thousands displaced, as some people live on the roadside with no or little access to food. There are people starving in areas and we are not able to give basic food for. The needs are rising faster than we are able to respond. Joining me now is Dr. Mark Siegel, Fox News medical contributor. Dr. Siegel, um, we thought the measles had largely been beaten uh, in the United States. Is there cause for concern here? Well, there's, co there's cause for concern, Laura, if you're not vaccinated. If you're vaccinated against measles or you had it when you were a kid, there's almost no chance of your getting it. The problem is worldwide. There's 9 million cases in the world last year, up 40 percent. And there's a big problem in Yemen not only Houthis, but also measles in, in Yemen, also in India. And the problem is with travelers. And, you know, we're not screening travelers, not to mention the southern border where we're not screening them at all, of course. So people are coming into the country, bringing diseases like measles, which we think is just a childhood disease, but can absolutely hospitalize you from pneumonia. So it's something we have to be concerned about. It's an easy fix. This vaccine has been around since the 1970s, the one we're using. It's safe and it's extremely effective. There's also been a surge in tuberculosis cases, Dr. Siegel, and um, many uh, you know, experts on this do link it back to the border because we have a lot of people crossing the border who are ill or they, you know, we can't check vaccination records of them. Students at a high school in North Carolina may have been exposed to a case. And just this past fall in New York, we had several cases. Um, your thoughts on this mini surge. You know, Laura, whereas measles is unbelievably easy to catch, if you're just in a room with it, you catch it. TB is harder to catch, but I think you're right that it's the border that's the issue. Let me tell you what the problem is. In Central America, people are getting partly treated for tuberculosis. So they come in here and that breeds a resistant strain. And we're seeing a huge increase, 5 to 10 percent, of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, which is extremely hard to eradicate, puts people in, in hospitals, spreads, and leads to death. So that's another reason that securing the border is so important. People around the world are asking what is going on. Everything seems to be falling apart in every possible way. Violence is at epidemic levels, with all the nations around the world full of anxiety and uncertainty of what tomorrow will bring. The Middle East is consumed by civil wars. Planet Earth is on the verge of World War III. Earthquakes are more frequent and more intense. Extreme weather has become the norm. We are seeing diseases that were once eradicated roaring back to life. People are starving to death because of politics, war, drought, and other weather-related catastrophes. People are looking for answers, and those who have eyes to see and ears to hear know exactly what is happening. Jesus, who is God in flesh form, is letting us know that through the events taking place around the world, He is returning. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. 
believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. See, call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.